All right. Welcome to, oh my gosh, Scott, I'm already forgetting the episode number. <laughs> What's the episode uh, 130, number? hold on, uh, 136. No, sorry, 236. 236. I was like, did we get back 100? Um, yeah. so welcome to 236 of the Artcasters, this show where we talk about the ins and outs of illustration, cartooning, graphic design, and, uh, and we uh, each week have alternating uh, guests. And uh, this week, I'm really excited to get in there introducing our guests. But before we do, we're going to go through the rooms and uh, tell everyone where to find our work. So uh, usually it starts with, with me. So in that case, I'll just tell you you're on my channel. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, hit the bell um, to get a notification when we're about to go live. Uh, you can also find my work at joshpatimble.com or uh, read a very brief preview of my graphic novel about faith and mental illness at quarterlystories.com. And so that's uh, that's my stuff. Scott, where can everybody find your work, sir? Uh, you can find me at cirqueworks.com. Uh, right now, I've got all my digital products are 40% off. And also, if you want to learn how to make comics, I have completed a course called Making Comics 101, which basically takes you step by step how to make comics, everything you need to know. There's I forget how many episodes, but there's, I don't know, there's 20, it's, it's like, was it like, maybe it's like, I don't know, it, it, it was like a 22 week course and there's three episodes every week. So it's tons and tons of info. And that is on my YouTube channel. It's, uh, it's just sort of works on YouTube. So I love it. Yeah, Gary, we have a little bit of slap back on this and we just got to kind of roll with it just so you know, in the chats. Um, uh, okay. So uh, our special guest uh, this week, uh, I'm going to just get into a little biography introducing him because uh, when I was in high school, like about 16, I took an elective course at AV College doing uh, illustration, like in 1996, and it was with this man, our guest, and I he ignited this uh, just complete passion for illustration um, prior to that, I knew I loved comic books and stuff like that. And so when I when I graduated and I, I went to the JC option before kind of transferring to a university, I enrolled in pretty much every class uh, our guest taught. And and uh, so he was my first illustration professor and is an extremely talented uh, fantasy artist, has written um, some incredible uh, books about marketing your work and uh and has created like a whole series of fantasy uh illustrations about the land of treach which i'm sure we'll get into um it's frank robert dixon so frank where can everyone find your work uh well you can find my work on my website frankrobertdixon.com and uh, you can also find me on pinterest and i sell prints of my artwork on fine art america and with Frank Robert Dixon, so you can also find my artwork there. Awesome, yeah, and I recommend people check it out. It's it's cool. It's mixed media, um, just beautifully rendered, really cool artwork. Um, okay, so what I was thinking uh, would be a good topic just uh, for for our first time having you on was to kind of go into teaching illustration. And, uh, and how you go about teaching illustration, um, especially introductory illustration, uh, what, what, you know, and, and so I was kind of curious, like maybe start off with like what led you into teaching illustration and then maybe we can kind of move from there. Okay. So what led you into teaching illustration? <laughs> well, that was always my favorite kind of art growing up and uh, I was an illustration major at an art school called Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. Awesome. Yeah, so I learned a lot there. And then after that, I moved out to Tucson, Arizona for a while. And I took an illustration class there also at the University of Arizona. And my, my teacher's name was Gerald Bishop. And I really loved the class. I did some exciting illustrations in the class. And uh, I kind of, my college class that I teach at Antelope Valley College in Lancaster, California, um, I patterned it quite a bit after that guy's class. I liked the way he did it. We would have critiques of all the art and uh, 
I even, even did, used a couple of the assignments. So that's a lot where I got, uh, I mean, I, I enjoy doing illustration too. And I've done some of that in, in the past. Um, back in the 90s, I actually worked out at NASA Dryden Flight Research Center as an illustrator, graphic designer for almost three years. And nice. that was fun. Um, but then, like I've heard in some of your other guys' things, you know, you want to do what you love. And I love doing my own artwork more. So I found a way to make money and not have to rely on doing artwork for other people. And I do that by teaching. And I love teaching. And I really think teaching has gotten my art even better because when you teach skills, you, you get even better at them and um, learning how to do it. So, uh, so that's kind of how I started doing that. I started teaching uh, the illustration class in 1992 uh, there at the college. And uh, I wasn't sure what year you were there, but you think it was 96, so I guess about 96. You well, it was 96 and then 99, I think, was when I was older. Yeah. yeah. Okay, 99. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, um, but I mean, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's been quite a while. Yeah. It's funny. I was thinking about it because it doesn't feel like that long ago. But then I was like, holy moly, like 1999 was like 20 something years ago. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. yeah. I, did, I, have, I did run into you down at um, Comic Con in San Diego a couple of times, I think. Yes. Somewhere yeah. Through, through the years. Yeah, I think we bumped into each other and kind of kept in touch um, throughout the years. But yeah, it's definitely um, it was definitely an impactful class to have. Um, I, I remember uh, one of the core things you kind of started with um, when w within that class was just kind of presenting the idea of drawing by shape. And uh, I right, I, I remember that being a really awesome kind of first lesson into like for me that clicked in a way that other art instructors hadn't where they were talking about you know like fluid lines and gestalt and stuff like that and i think you were one of the first to just kind of break it down to like well you know when you see a shape like what you're doing in drawing is kind of replicating the shape you're seeing and trying to get them accurate to what you're seeing and i thought that was such a neat um approach you know is uh, I don't. I don't know if you wanted to. <laughs> yeah, I'll talk a little bit about that. I have. I have I'm going to grab right here and show you this related to that. This is that. I love it. Um, uh, Frank in the chat said he was 20 in 1999, and I was 19 at that time. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway, I took a class at Art Center College of Design called Drawing for Illustration, and Bill Robles was the instructor, and he was a a courtroom artist um, for many, many years. He might still be. But uh, he only taught us one thing the whole semester, basically. It's how to draw by shape. And this is the drawing I actually did in his class way back in 1980 or something. And this was a model that I drew. And I actually cut this up a little bit so that, um, let me see. I don't know if I can do this. Yeah, there we go. But like this hat has a shape. And there it is. I took it right out. <laughs> I made this up to show people. You know, you got to draw by shape, and if you draw the shape accurately, your drawing will, you know, work much better. And so it's a technique that I've used my whole life, and I teach students draw by shape. And there's shapes everywhere. Whenever you draw anything, I mean, the beard has a shape. You got to get the shape just right. Even the face has a shape. I don't know if I can pop them out of here, but they do pop out. That's awesome. Really used to pop out. <laughs> like right here. That's a shape. Yeah. So anyway, it's a, it's a good technique for drawing. It's certainly not the only way to draw, but anytime you're observing something and trying to accurately draw it, that's what it works. I know for me, um, if I'm ever having trouble drawing something I'm observing, I switch to that mode. I say, okay, I know if I can get the shapes right, it'll turn out good. I love that. That's such a good example of uh, of it, and kind of to break it down into a visual is a really cool idea too. Yeah, uh, I talked about that in in my comics course, but I never. I mean that 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 visual example you had was just. I've never even thought of doing that. That's that's really cool. It really drives the point home. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It, it does. It helps people really see what you're talking about. <laughs> that's awesome. 
So, um, so, so you worked at NASA as an illustrator and a designer. Um, so, and, and what's interesting is that transition you're describing is pretty, uh, a pretty common through line you notice with a lot of illustrators and designers and artists that you meet where it's, it's fulfilling and cool to do work professionally, but, um, but it's, there's this weird desire I think most artists have to like create and, and make stuff that's their own. And so to kind of find a way to be able to kind of facilitate that and also do something you're passionate about and not kind of drain the, the soul out of your art, I think that's a really, uh, that's a really, that's a really cool thing, you know? Yeah, I agree. Um, I did enjoy working at NASA though. I, it was what I hear from other people. I think it was probably a better job than a lot of people. I, I got to make some pretty cool posters. I have this one where a bunch of airplanes are having lunch. Uh, I made it at, anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, but, but I do like doing my own thing. And this is, uh, I'm kind of known for these, these things. They're called, I call them trees. They're trees with faces. Oh, and so, um, yeah, so you, and I sell prints of those on the internet. And uh, I've done a long series of those. Um, to be honest with you, the way they started was, I was feeling kind of frustrated when I was about 30 years old, maybe 31, uh, with my art. I didn't know what I really wanted to do with it. And so I was doing a picture one time of a face with a hand up to it. And I just, just make the fingers all go down to the bottom and look like roots. So I turned the guy into a tree. And, uh, and so that started a long series of these tree creatures, which I have created. And uh, you, you can see them on my website if you look under the gallery there and see more of them. That's awesome. But I always like fantasy art. Here's another picture that I, uh, you know, painted this this big this guy. What what medium do you use? Well, let me look at it and see. I did this a while back. It's mostly watercolor, but it also has uh, some acrylic. Wow. I use uh, I use gesso a lot. Sometimes I I use gesso and kind of with watercolor. It's kind of a combination of media that I kind of like using. Yeah, and actually, I, I think that was one of the really unique things about your course, too, was that you um, teach a lot of mixed media. and um, I do. And I remember learning some really cool techniques, including one that I've been wanting to <laughs> find an excuse to use, um, you know, which is, which is the um, uh, you, you kind of like spray down your board with, with water and, and make sure it's like pretty heavily saturated with water and then you hit it with oil-based oil paint and uh, oil-based spray paint. Oh yeah, and right, right. right. This crazy like pattern. Um, it, it gives you, it, the oil and the water don't mix so you get wonderful textures and it gives you a great, I mean, everybody nowadays uses a computer but there's some things the computer can't quite do the same as traditional media. Yeah. Uh, and and it's it's anyway, it's pretty fun. I don't think I, I have any right here handy to show that well I take it back. No, I don't think so. I might use that technique in this a little bit. This is a creature I painted, um, a robot. That's awesome. And he's got lots of gears and things. That's very so, cool. I'll use splatters. I, I like to use all sorts of techniques. I typically will start drawing with pencil on illustration board. I also work on the computer, but I prefer the traditional media. I just have more fun with it. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I'll actually work traditionally for a while, take a good photo of it, scan it in the computer, work on the computer some, and then I've actually printed it out and then worked right on top of the print and done more to it that way. And that's kind of an unusual, interesting way to work too. Yeah. I, I love doing that. Um, with with comics for a while, I was printing blue lines on uh, like I had I had a printer at the time that was like a sheet roll printer. So if I got a job from a client, I'd kind of sketch it, scan it, like clean it up, print it in blue line, and then ink directly over it. <laughs> but right. uh, I don't know what happened to that printer because I now like that's not going to work <laughs> with. With what I got now, but that's that's a cool approach to just kind of work direct on the print. Why not? Yeah, I, I did. I've done some illustration jobs years ago where I uh, 
I drew it all by hand with a pencil and then I, um, what did I do? Oh, I just scanned it in the computer and I printed out my line drawing on watercolor paper. Uh -huh. Just painted with watercolor and I didn't have to redraw it. it was, I'm sure you guys have noticed, at least a lot of artists, this is true. Our rough sketches look better than the final drawings. Yeah. The final drawing, we tighten up too much. Yeah. So I, I, I've found that I, if I can, I prefer to stay with my rough sketch because it's usually better than when I try to draw it more carefully, it seems like. Yeah, it's there's nothing nothing sadder than that moment when you uh, kind of overwork a, a rough and kind of destroy it in the final, and it's like and it looked beautiful at, at first, you know. Right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, you you had, you wanted me to talk a little bit about I know uh, kind of how I do the illustration class. Yeah. So I I actually um, I make a living as a high school art teacher. I teach drawing and painting, and also I teach drawing and illustration at a community college. And my favorite class I teach is my illustration class at the community college. And they're supposed to have a prerequisite that they're supposed to take drawing before they take that class. But, you know, I'm, community college is not real, always real advanced. So a lot of them don't know how to draw too well still. So what I usually do is the first four or five weeks, I do a crash course in drawing skills. I talk about drawing by shape, um, light and shadow, mm -hmm. the basic forms, cube sphere, cone and cylinder. Um, spend a, you know, a couple of hours on the basics of perspective. Mm -hmm. And then probably one of the most important ones that even the people that can draw pretty well that don't seem to know a lot about is composition. You know, designing all the shapes when you make, a, make an illustration. Yeah. Um, and then also I have them, uh, the last couple of semesters, I've been having them uh, do an assignment where they have to draw 10 heads and 20 hands one week. Because those are the, two of the most important things to be able to draw well. And a lot of people, you know, that's one of the harder things to do well. So. And, and then the rest of the semester, we do illustrations where they have either one or two weeks to do them and do critiques of them. And that's kind of how I do the class. Mm -hmm. pretty well. I love that. And, and I do remember, um, especially like even the perspective assignment, I think at that point, you know, of course, when you're, you're, you know, you're the age I was when I took that class, I was kind of cocky because I was like, I felt like a very big fish in a small pond <laughs> kind of yeah. scenario. Um, I always, I always joke with uh, new illustrators who ask about kind of art school and the experience. And I'm like, art school is, you, you, you end up in art school and you might have been the biggest fish in the pond and you realize there's an ocean and there's sharks and whales <laughs> and you're, you know, um, but, but I remember the time I took your class, I think I was a little too headstrong and probably cocky for my own good. Um, and, and your class was one of the first where I actually was like sat down and legitimately did perspective um, and, and realized through doing that, like how much I had to learn. <laughs> Um, because I remember, you know, you, you did have a lot of uh, a lot of homework like assignments that were drawn within your you know, sketchbook as well as like in class assignments and stuff. And that was one of our big ones that I initially was like, yeah, we, we got this. And I think I took it with Josh, uh, the other Josh who you're familiar with. But um, but uh, it, it, we both like were just struggling with that uh, that assignment at first. And and I think which assignment was it? Uh, it was just, it was like drawing a building of our choosing in, in full perspective. And there were specific things that had to have in the drawing. Oh, um, I might have a list of things you had to include, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember just struggling through that, but it was a very valuable thing. And you're right, like had kind of some of the more core like drawing courses before that, like gone over perspective, that wouldn't be necessary. But I've noticed that too, with teaching, like it's sometimes good to not assume that people have um, like a, a further knowledge, like a knowledge they should have had <laughs> coming in. Um, yeah, because yeah. I because I taught at LCAD for a little bit, and when I was teaching at LCAD, uh, the, um, the there was a prerequisite for typography because um, I was teaching like a graphic design and illustration course. Um, where people would design the posters and mainly learn production for art. 
And uh, kids would come in and I'd be like, oh, just fix the letting on your type. And they'd be like, the what? And I'm like, you had type, right? <laughs> like, you had like the kerning? No, I don't know what kerning is. And I remember, oh, like learning that pretty quickly. Like, oh, okay, I got to step back and just kind of assume maybe they don't know, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. But that's a that's a good method. I mean, I'm glad you used it because I, I think your class was probably the first where I really had to do perspective. Yeah. Right. Well, well, good. Yeah. Uh, I know I I went all the way through high school and the community college, even a four year college, and I never learned perspective. It wasn't until I went to art center that I had two semesters in it, and then I really learned it. And it's you know it's kind of hard to learn. It, you know, it's a little challenging. <laughs> so I'd yeah. to get to it. Yeah, we. Um, the, the, I I like to think I know perspective, but uh, Scott can attest to this. Like we had, we had David Kelsey on here, and uh, and that man, like, can do perspective where it grids out on a globe, and it's like I'm like I don't I don't know perspective. Like I kind of know perspective. I don't know perspective like that. <laughs> you know perspective good enough that you can make your pictures look cool. Yeah, exactly. And I and I'll cheat it if I can. <laughs> right. Um, that's cool though. So you so you kind of touch over the, the basic introductory stuff. Um, composition is a really a really uh, strong thing that I I vividly remember from your class too, especially the the going over kind of the balance of light and dark and like kind of composing an image almost based on just like a flat black and a flat white and cr trying to kind of find um, a, a symmetry and balance. And I, I think that's cool too, like, at, cause at, at a community college, I didn't have like a 2D design class, you know, I don't think they offered that. Um, but you managed to get some 2D design in that, that first core week. I think that's, that's really cool, you know? Yeah, well, composition is, I think it seems like one of the harder things that people have trouble learning real well. It, even I get artists coming in that can draw pretty well, but they usually don't. They don't seem to understand the value of a good composition. And, and all the professional art you see out there, it's all designed beautifully. The positive and negative shapes. Um, usually, there's a focal point, visual journeys. Your eye is led around the picture, and and those things make make the pictures look look better. Um, Trying to think of anything. One thing that I, I learned that I always liked is professional illustrations, um, you can copy their composition. And I learned this in uh, from that guy named Gerald Bishop in Tucson. And he, uh, he, you can literally, you know, you can draw a little thumbnail sketch of a composition, the basic shapes. Yeah. And you can use those basic shapes, make a totally different picture out of it. And you have a strong composition, and um, I even think it would be a cool idea. And I don't, haven't done it to too much of a degree, but you could you could literally have a sketchbook and you just draw all the best compositions you could find, and you could just refer to it and kind of use one sometime for some project you're working on that fits what you're doing. Um, I, That's uh, an excellent uh, yeah. recommendation. I, I've had. A couple friends you've done, like where they've watched like a Hitchcock film and just sketched, like paused and sketched frames, um, and then studied those just to try to kind of learn how how like you can frame a picture in a dynamic and interesting way. Um, I I have always meant to do something like that and never <laughs> did that. Yeah. Yeah. pictures and to try to dissect what's working about them. Um, and like the rule of thirds and, and follow that kind of thing. But I do think you're right about that being so vital because I have often met very skilled artists who I can out compose. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a good, it, it's, a, it, it's almost like a, I, I'd like to say it's like a shortcut to making your stuff look better. Yeah. You know, absolutely. Yeah. It does. Um, it's, it's amazing that how much, and, and a lot of people don't understand, and even you know, amateur artists, they don't really realize that the really professional looking stuff, all the shapes are designed really well, just like you know, computer you know, graphic design, logos, it's all shapes, you know, shapes are important. Mm -hmm. So, and this makes the picture, and I love, 
I love making the shapes look cool and designing the, the shapes. I think it's fun. And That's I try awesome. to get people to, to, to see that when they're creating things. Like if you're drawing hair, you don't want to just copy the photo, you know, design the hair, make it look cool. Oh, yeah. I love that. And even here, if you try to kind of like, uh, you know, a, a lot of people when they're drawing, it's like you're going to try to draw, you know, initially like every strand of hair um, and not think about like the blocks of tape or the volume of it. Right. 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 I, I think one of the coolest things about that is, yeah, like find that kind of weird, like the cutout Frank was showing find that that awesome kind of shape of that hat like what's that overall kind of dynamic shape that you can make that to make it you know um, that's really really keen advice <laughs> right uh, yeah well that's true mm -hmm. um what else oh this is just something this is like a little exercise i have people you know learn how to draw the four forms bring yeah. these things and uh because everything's made out of those basic forms and if they learn how to light and shadow works for those forms. It helps to just, you know, rob things better. Um, I always have some students in my illustration class that don't seem to have a very strong background in drawing. I have some that are more advanced and some more beginning. Um, and I always tell them all, you know, um, when you see when you see somebody's artwork that's amazing, it's, uh, it's intimidating, but it's also inspiring, two I words, and, and both are normal. Um, I remember a friend of mine and I, um, back when I was probably 19 or so, uh, we, we went to the art gallery at Art Center College of Design before I ever went to school there. We just walked around and looked at all the amazing pictures. And we were both intimidated and inspired. And uh, that it was, it was fun. We knew we could keep getting better if we kept practicing and, you know, you know went to school there and helped and everything. So it was fun. Yeah, and I, th I think that that is also a good part of growth for an artist too, right? Because I think initially, if you if you uh, aren't looking at work that's better than your own to kind of advance, um, or try like uh, trying to look at like the far rung of the ladder that you haven't quite reached yet, right? Um, I, I do think it's possible to become really stagnant as an artist. Um, whereas if you're looking if you're constantly kind of looking at that that beautiful, inspiring work, um, especially when you're training, and learning it, like heading into college and, and gonna learn art, um, half of why I'm any bit decent in art is because of classmates, you know, and uh, and the, that peer system where you're having to put your stuff up on the wall for critique, and there's a bit of intimidation with that, where you're like, you want to actually have your stuff hold up. Um, but that, that's a good, there's a healthy part to that that's like really, really important to grow. And I think, I think you're right, like the, the inspiration from other arts and intimidation is a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they are, they are. intimidation, I think, initially, you know. Yeah. How do you help students overcome that hurdle of like kind of being intimidated by like something they haven't attained yet? Because you know? I do remember in your class, not feeling um, like super scared of like advancing, like it felt like an adventure. And I'm, I'm curious how to create that atmosphere. For, well, for I, try to, I try to keep it lighthearted and friendly and I encourage everyone to enjoy being who they are because, um, you know, everybody who's an amazing artist, most likely, you know, a few years back weren't so amazing artists, you, you get better with practice. And, um, and also, everybody kind of develops their own style. Um, like I've had sometimes a student where they just they work in this kind of off style, and I can't get them to get real realistic. They've got this unusual style. And I let them do that. I encourage them to try to make things real. But I also encourage them to enjoy making it the style they want to work in, you know, as good high quality as you can in whatever sort of style you work in. Um, I, I, I just, yeah, I, I do. I try to encourage people. I also tell them, you know, it's exciting if there's some really, you know, amazing artists in the class. And when you see some artist that does something super amazing, it's okay to feel a little intimidated, but also be inspired and and, and learn from it. Um, when, we, when I do a critique, um, 
I, I tell students, you can, uh, you can learn a whole bunch just by looking at the board. If I don't say a single thing, because if you're like me, when I was in a class where I would put my picture up, the natural tendency is you look and see how yours compares to all the other people's. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and if there's somebody that's, you know, is, is, is better than yours, you can get ideas in your head, you know, like maybe they have more value contrast. They do it amazing. You know, what are the cool things they did? So, uh, and, that, and I do critiques where we, I talk about pictures, the students do too and things. But uh, I think critiques are quite valuable. It helps you realize, you know, a lot of times people, when they do artwork, illustrations or any kind of artwork, we're usually only a, a foot or two from it looking at it. But then you do a critique and you're 15 feet away and you don't see the value contrast. Your picture is maybe too light and you, uh, you don't realize, you know, I think pictures are best if they look good up close and 15 feet away. And yeah. That, that's the best picture, usually. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a good point, too, of, of like kind of creating compositions that will come out from a distance. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah. And, and a very valuable lesson because there's, um, like I said, there are some people who are extremely talented at drawing, but their drawing collapse at a distance. And that, that can be problematic. Right. Um, whereas if, if your app is competent at drawing, but your art can hold up from a distance, you've actually gained a huge advantage. And I, I think that's the um, that's really cool. It's a, it's a good yeah, thing. I honestly think the picture will look better up close too if it shows up well from a distance because you got more value contrast. Yeah. Um, people, a lot of students don't realize that that they need to you know, push the dark areas and. And just like three or four values is ideal. You don't need lots of values. You know. Yeah. White, gray, and black, or white, light, gray, medium, gray, and black, which, which well. I love that. That's great advice. Um, it's that that's fascinating too because it does remind me of like some of my favorite painters. Um, like Lucian Freud is one of my favorite painters of later work. And it's like you look at a Lucian Freud from a distance, and it's it's brilliant and kind of realistic. And there's a lot of color. Um, in shadow, which is really hard to pull off. But then you look at it up close, and it's just blobs of paint. Like you can't, and and it's kind of amazing to see that um, that control over the color and the slabs of color that that actually work effectively to work it from a distance. But it's equally as fascinating to get up close and realize, oh, oh, they, it looks detailed, but that's just the flick of a brush. Like that's not, you know. And, and, but that's amazing. <laughs> um, oh, it is amazing. Another illustrator that I admire is a guy named N.C. Wyeth. Oh, yeah. He, he was back in, you know, 1900s and 1945 or so. He did a lot of illustrations for classics and things. And uh, from a distance, his paintings look quite realistic. But if you get up close, they're very painterly with brush strokes and everything. And, uh, and it's, it's pretty fun. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite things to draw is faces. I love drawing faces. And um, last last summer in August, I was a demonstration artist at a local fair here called the Antelope Valley Fair. And this is a photo of it, but this is a drawing I did. It was a charcoal drawing and then acrylic washes. And so I had fun drawing this. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just like a two hour drawing. It's gonna take a long time, but uh, it, it was fun. and. Uh, and when I did the charcoal drawing, I was, you know, sensitively putting the charcoal on. I actually did it lightly with pencil first. I actually, as I recall, put the washes in first and then the charcoal right over the top of the, of the, uh, the washes. I but love that. What, whatever you guys, whatever you love to do, that's what you should pursue doing, um, I think, and and uh, if you can. and and. And it, seems, and, and, and it seems to be true that there's something we all are drawn to in, in, in the kind of art we would like to be doing. And as you figure that out, you know, and, and I love copying artists that are really good because they're better than me and I can learn from them. Um, I've been practicing lately. Um, I forgot the guy's name. He worked for Mad Magazine. He passed away several years ago. Jack Davis. Oh, okay. I was of Drucker, Jack Davis, one of the yeah, yeah, yeah. Those guys. 
Anyway, Jack Davis, I love the way he does those, those caricature, you know, drawings of people and everything. So I've been yeah. trying for my imagination to get better at drawing like that. And let me see, I've got, well, this is a drawing I did copying of Jack Davis. This is this uh -huh. picture is one of his that I copied looking at it. That's great. Yeah. But um, somewhere, anyway, here's a picture that I did for my, well, here's a picture I did of a guy running from my imagination, being influenced by Jack Davis. Nice. You know, the skinny arms and everything. And Jack Davis is, a, I love his like knuckles and his hands the way he Yeah, them. well, I do too. This is a painting I was working on recently. It originally was just a landscape, and then I added the monster. <laughs> and I was doing it from by Jack Davis, the way I did the monster running through the forest. That's, that's awesome. Since I've got, pull out one more thing here. This is something I've demonstrated to students. Like, here's a robot. And you've got a light over here. Where's the light? Light's over here. And, you know, light travels in a straight line. So all the forms, when they face the light, will be in light. And they go in shadow on the other side. And so light and shadow and forms, that's, if you get the hang of how to do that, that helps you make stuff up and, you know, render forms better. That's awesome. I love it. So, um, so what it, what are like the core things you kind of aim to have somebody leave um, an illustration class kind of equipped with? Like it, it sounds like composition, um, shape, uh, rendering, a rough I, idea of rendering. <laughs> I, I, I actually tell them in the class that I'm, tr I'm trying to train you if you want to become an illustrator, but all of these skills really also work to be any kind of, any kind of artist you want. You know, yeah. if you want to be a landscape artist or whatever artist you want, these are skills that will help you make high quality, realistic artwork or whatever style you want to work in. Um, but I, um, and, and I try to, and I think everybody gradually is going to develop their own style just naturally. Um, but I, I did come across something on the internet about an interesting way to develop a style that I, 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 I thought about trying is pick out like three or four of your favorite artists and set out, you know, the very best example of each of them and then try to take parts of each of that and make a picture, kind of your picture you normally make, but try to take some of the cool things you like about three different artists and put it into the picture and you're kind of like, be pushing your, it's kind of like developing a style, you know, we've all done that to a degree, you know, you copy some artists for a while. Yeah. Like, I kind of like the idea of doing that, and I'm I'm going to do that here. I have been collecting artists that I like, and I haven't actually gotten around to actually trying to put several together in one picture. But I'm kind of excited about playing it um, because there are artists that you know, like I, I really like like um, J C Leyendecker has Leyendecker has a really cool style that I like, um, and then there's weird artists that like oh, what's the name but. There's artists, uh, abstract expressionists, the big black strokes that I do that are cool. And it kind of reminds me of um, Frank Miller's Thin City, some of those big black areas. You probably have seen uh -huh. those. Um, so anyway, um, it, I think that's kind of a fun thing to do is to find artists you really like a lot and try to uh, copy some of their style. And uh, sometimes you can just directly copy them for a while and try to learn from them. Um, yeah, and and then some of that will come into your own art when you when you do it. Yeah, I think that's that's a neat idea to like try that intentionally because it's like I think I think we all kind of end up doing that a bit as we're developing as artists because I think you know at least at first I think when I first started drawing I was kind of mimicking two or three guys I really liked anyway, and then as you develop and grow you start kind of absorbing new work and you're like, oh, I like, like, like for me, I was always fascinated with um, feathering and I couldn't figure out what that was. And uh, so I remember trying to mimic feathering with like outlining a feathered brush, like the little feather points with like a, with a ballpoint pen. And then like being like, well, ballpoint pens aren't working. I should probably use microns. 
Um, I tried repeater graphs for a week, like our art students, and then went back to microns because that's the way to go. You never want to clean repeater graphs. <laughs> And then, uh, but th but then finally, like I saw somebody actually lay one down with, you know, a Windsor Newton Fury 7. And I was like, ah, that's the thing. That's the thing I've been trying. You know, this is, um, but, but the point being, like, I think I got that from um, a different artist. And it's like, you kind of pull all these different things and they end up in this like soup that your style Anyway, but the idea of, I, I do, that does kind of excite me, like the idea of intentionally just being like, okay, I'm going to pick three artists and mix them and see what happens. Like that's, that's right. a kind of cool idea. I, I mean, you know, it's in your own style with them, just, you know, some, because you're there. And so you kind of come up with a kind of unique style that still feels kind of like you. Yeah. Got these other elements coming in that you like that kind of expands your your art a little and it's a new direction it's kind of kind of fun that's a really fun idea i think uh for for those in the chats like uh, i want to see if you guys if you guys try this challenge frank just laid out uh let us know let us see the art we want to see it that, that sounds like a really cool idea yeah you could tell us the three artists you combined and then see what your picture looks like it's kind of fun. i love it um, Corey in the chat mentioned a, a good resource for uh, screen grabs of like awesome movies and compositions that he uses uh, to uh, Great. stuff too. So good to know. That's good. Um, yeah. All right. Um, well, I, I like that idea of like developing a style. How did, how would you say your style developed um, for, for your fantasy art? Because like you do use a lot of really cool mixed media. You mix a lot of like colored pencil with like with right. you know acrylic and and uh, well, I, I grab anything that works would be will work well to make the picture look good. I I don't know for sure where I got all of that from. Um, I did have some art teachers that tried had us do mixed media, and I, I kind of liked it. Um, I did, uh, I remember when I was like 25 years old or so in a bookstore, I came across a book I really liked. It was called The Land of Proud. Oh, yeah. It, oh. Are you the actual book? Brian okay. Proud. Land Proud. Yeah. And uh, I love his early work when he was in his 20s. His later stuff is, is good too, but my favorite work he did was all with watercolor and it was in his, in his 20s. And so I... Uh, I looked at that book a lot and uh, I copied things out of it some. Um, and I did a couple of illustrations where I was influenced strongly by him. And uh, I found out with watercolor and illustration board, you could actually lift out areas. And I would I would have like dark brown forest like, and I actually found out I could wet it and lift out areas and make it look like really cool tree branches in, in the in the dark. dark. And uh, so that was kind of fun. and. Uh, so different artists, um, other artists that I like a lot were Arthur Rackham, um, Maxfield Paris, and Brian Proud. And those artists influenced the look of some of my fantasy art that I like to do. Um, but the trees, I had no intention of doing trees. I think I already told you, kind of, I said earlier, kind of how I started doing those. But uh, I've done a lot of those through the years. You find something here. I have struggled some with my emotions through the years, being a little depressed at times. And so I made a whole book, and I see journals and things where I write down things. Yeah. This is a book that I made called Struggles of a Tweet. Hmm. And um, I wrote on the back of the book here, it says, most of the words in this book are entries I made in my journal. I would pour out the words in my head onto the page. And so a lot of these... Anyway, I got these, some of the pictures. So this is a self-published book. Um, and I've got a lot of my tree creature pictures in the, in, in the book, along with my journal entries. Right here I wrote, this journal is not about great writing. It is about great struggling. Mm -hmm. Nice. I remember putting that on the first page of my sketchbook, something like that, saying this is just a, this is, you know, just to make sure that you're not being too precious with it. But yeah. 
Right, right. I wrote here, I struggle much because I do little. If I do much, I struggle little. <laughs> and I think that's a pretty good truth. When I yeah. sit and waste the whole day, I'm not doing too well. If I'm busy doing stuff, I'm enjoying the day more. Yeah, we talk about that a lot on here um, because it, it, there's, a, there's this kind of, I think this drive for creatives to be working on stuff, to be creating. Like we're, I think we're almost made to do that. And so I think when we when we get stuck in kind of a trap of like not not making or not producing, not creating, it can cause like a, a great amount of uh, dissatisfaction for creatives because creatives naturally like have a desire to be creative. Um, and so it, it and and it's across the board. Like uh, I, I I've, I've almost every artist I've met has has this weird drive where it's like even if we want able to make a living doing it we'd be doing it. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. It's one of my favorite things to do is, is yeah, if I'm if I'm drawing a picture and it's starting to look kind of cool, it definitely makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a weird thing, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. But it's uh it's it's true. It seems to be cool. Yeah. yeah. 100 percent yeah um i i think uh i i actually think that's a really uh well this was well put too kind of like the uh the idea of idle hands as the devil's playground and i'd agree with that yeah um i i i will catch myself um you know i i remember it was like my second year as an art director um and my son was still pretty little i i had spent like two years just doing the day job art directing. And uh, and I, I found myself like super depressed. And I realized it was because I wasn't working on comics or personal work outside of the day job. So I I realized like I have to just do that like daily or or I become very unhappy. <laughs> like it's just part of who I am. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, so I, and I think that's a pretty common, common narrative. Uh, Scott, have you ever caught yourself in that funk? Like where it's like the, the non-creating stuff. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then being like, Oh, I just need to actually make something. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I get that feedback from so many people and, you know, obviously I struggle with that, but I think, you know, as, as you guys know, when you, when you do that, where you're, you know, where you have, have to put out, you know, artwork, like at a day job or something and people, are, you know, you can't just like, I don't, I'm not feeling it today. Oh, yeah. You don't really have a choice. So just because of that, I kind of got into the thing. And you know, like if I, if I'm frustrated with something I'm working on, or it's not coming to me. Um, cause I've got crazy ADHD, so I'll switch to some other project and I've got like a laundry list of different things I can work on. So, um, so I, you know, I always have something and sometimes it's not necessarily art, but it's more the business aspect of art if I just need to take a break from art. But yeah. 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 I think that's, I don't know. I, I definitely also think once you crack open that can of worms and actually start making and creating it, it creates its own kind of momentum. And so uh, that can get get people out of a funk. I think, I would I would say, this is the best best method to use use those things as fuel for your art. That's a, that's exciting. Where Frank? Where could everybody? Uh, do you still um, sell those books as well? Like the one you just showed. Um, the only book that you can readily get is the most recent book I've done. It's called Crossing the Troll Bridge. This you can get on Amazon. I love it. And it's a book on a marketing guide for artists and writers. And I illustrated the whole book. It's got some rough illustrations here. Let's see. Okay. Go and see what I'm showing you. Um, anyway, and this is a book that I'm the co author, but I'm not the illustration. Uh, I'm, I'm the illustration person. But the other person is the marketing person, Robin Blakely. Nice. So she, wrote, she wrote most of it. I'm still working on figuring out how to market myself better, but but uh, it's got oh let's see it's got lots of pictures in it. So I can, and it's basically it starts out talking about how each of us as an artist we have a castle that we live in. 
you all live in this castle, right? No, I know you don't really. But uh, <laughs> the, the idea is that's the artist's castle, and you have rooms in there where you create. And um, but the idea of the book is once you create things, you need to find a way to connect with the uh, your audience that's uh, over here. And there's a bridge across, and there's a troll under the bridge, and the <laughs> audience is not getting to you. And the idea is, how do you get your audience to connect with you? And the book's got some pretty good things, I think, about how to do that. Um, this is supposed to be a cartoon version of me. So it's kind of, I'm, I'm kind of in the story, this cartoon Frank. And uh, you got to go find your audience. So here's cartoon Frank looking for the audience that, you know, is the right audience for him and what he does. And then you need to go through and look for all through all your artwork and pick out, you know, your best things that you have that, you know, people would want to buy. So that's what this picture is supposed to be. I love it. Anyway, it's, uh, and then talked about the troll and huh. understanding the troll. The troll is your, the fear. You know, what is it that's, you know, keeping you and your audience separated? Um, because understanding what that troll is in real life is the key to success. Troll represents all the fears, difficulties, and obstacles that separate you and your fans. So you gotta you gotta confront the troll and conquer the troll. Anyway, it goes on from there. And the uh, anyway, I think it's a pretty good book about uh, how to market yourself. And it's done in kind of a fun, lighthearted style, so it's not like Hard yeah yeah and i think that's um that's that's a good that's a great analogy for kind of marketing your work i think one of the biggest hesitations people have um with with kind of self-promotion and things like that as artists is is really a fear rooted in like a fear of success and not so much a fear of failure and success brings a lot of a lot of stuff with it like um you know uh like the, the first thing you get published it's like well, now you have you're working at it, and and there's ramifications from that, right? But like, is it good enough? Like, and you're actually going to hear feedback, and it will be good or bad. And so I I think that analogy of um, all of those kind of things you wrestle with to get to your audience as being a troll is pretty brilliant, a uh, pretty good way to get it out. Yeah, it's all cool. And and just. If you just take small steps in that direction, I mean, I have not done as much with marketing certainly as I could, but just, I had a couple of art friends that had their artwork on this Fine Art America, and they encouraged me to do it, and so I did it. And, you know, now I, you know, some months I sell several things on there, and I know you guys have talked about different places. You guys sell prints and shirts and different things. Um, but it's, it's fun to have a little bit of passive income from putting your artwork out there somewhere. But yeah. I've had yeah. people things from all over the world, different countries around the world. Pretty fun. Yeah, that's like the most fulfilling thing because uh, we're because we're not making this stuff to be, you know, kept in a, in a like a forest where it'll fall and make no sound, you know. So it's it's yeah. it's a good thing to kind of try to um, to get that lesson to younger artists um, because it, like for me that's that was a hard hard learned lesson. It's always it, it, the first challenge is just trying to get good, and uh, and you know th that's such a hurdle. And then once you kind of start getting the hang of the thing, it's like it's it, it, most of us aren't really in the mood to like market it, <laughs> you know. It's like this is a headache to make. Um, Scott and I talk about this too, where it's like you know we like making the comic. The the hard part's like when you're done with a comic or a book or a product, like the extra stuff is the, is the part that requires so much like self will because none of us want to do that once it's done, <laughs> like, you know? Right. And, and yeah, so, oh, I, this is a picture I made. This is what you don't want to do if you want to market yourself. Castle, you know, castle of the artist, no trespassing, you know, you, nobody could even come and see your art. Right. <laughs> uh, but, 
I don't know. And um, I know for a while, I uh, my I used to have my website for a while. There was no way to buy anything on it, so no wonder nobody was buying anything. <laughs> but at least now I have a you know I, I have a link to Fine Art America where you can buy prints and all that. That's so, good. That's yeah. good. I still need to update my store section because I had it uh, working fine, and then the last six or so years I've just let it <laughs> let it sit. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, that's that's brilliant. Um, that is really that's that sounds like a really good book and, and very helpful. I think for people who started. So and it's, I was just going to add anytime, you know, and we, when we talk about David Chelsea, he kind of approaches it the same way. Uh, also Scott McLeod, but where you, if you have an art book, if you tell it with illustrations or, in, you know, so it's just not regular prose or whatever, or regular, you know, just descriptions and everything. If you actually use art to tell it and tell it in a way like, like you're, you're teaching, but it's also like a story. So it's just, for me as an artist, it's a lot easier to learn visually like that. Right, right. I, I think so. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a, a unique thing about your teaching too is that you show really good visual examples and you do a lot of drawing in front of the, the room and a lot of it's very much learning by doing and learning by seeing. And I find that that is uh, one of, you know, I know everybody has different learning styles, but I feel like most visual artists need visual learning. Um, for us to get it, it just you know, for me at least, that's the only um, one of the few approaches that works. <laughs> I remember when I was uh, in a college, I had this one drawing class. The drawing teacher never drew something the entire semester, and I always wondered if he could draw. He would tell us to draw, but it was really weird. You know, the guy never drew anything, and uh, so I never, I didn't want to be a teacher like that. You know, so yeah, I, I draw a lot. You know, I know you guys are both into comic books. I've never been into comic books a lot, but for five years, from 1995 to 2000, I taught a summer school class on how to draw superhero comics. And um, these were a couple of them. But I, the, the, uh, the whole class would write a story, and then we'd, I'd have all the students um, draw each character, and then we would put the characters up, um, on the wall, and we would vote for which character we wanted to be, and then eventually everybody had to draw one page in the comic book, and then I printed the whole comic book up, and we actually took it to a local comic book store and had a comic book signing and had people come and buy them. That's cool. I and love it. It was pretty fun. That's awesome. That's kind of a cool way to teach comics too. Um, we we've. We've had a few people on who taught taught comics courses, um, but to actually have the them do their own individual pages and then print it and sell them that's, yeah. that's smart. That's that's a really neat and, the, and the students even came and signed the comic books when people you know when people bought them. Of course, I don't know if there's there's not as many comic book stores around. There still is that one. Around here, but not too many comic books. Around here. Yeah, I think we get, we got bases, and then there's the smaller one that I always forget the name of. Um, I'm kind of new to coming back here, <laughs> so it's right. like I'm less familiar. But um, but a lot of them don't. They don't have like a huge indie section, and the stuff I like is like all the all the black and white like fanographics type stuff, which they're not going to carry. <laughs> um, but I, but I still do appreciate that there's comic shops like Kicking in the AV. I mean, it's, it's a hard market. Um, you know, in a commuter town, it's, it's a tough thing to pull off. Right, right. But uh, yeah, um, that is that is a really cool way to way to teach comics. With with it, that, I just kind of thought it up, but it seemed to work quite well. Um, the guys, they really. I bought a bunch of, uh, at the time when I taught the class, I bought a bunch of uh, comic book shirts. And one of the guys told me later, he says, hey, why are you always wearing those brand new comic book shirts? You know, I had Spider-Man and Fantastic Four, and I bought a bunch of shirts like that. It was kind of fun. And uh, I had somebody locally that do, you know, you know, do superhero comics better than me, so I had them come in and draw on the board too and show them how to you know, draw even better. It was fun. That's awesome. 
I even had one professional comic artist come and talk one time. Can't think of his name now, but he was he was really good. I remember one thing he told us all. He said, "Don't copy from your friend that's a little better than you. Steal from the very best artist. Copy the best artist in the world of the style you like. That's who you want to learn from." And I thought that was good advice. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you set like the bar just at, at your friend, like you're not necessarily going to rank up. Like you want to, you want to like set the, the bar impossibly high. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I think that's. I I, I remember uh, that being a hard lesson because I've always been very competitive. And so I think, especially in my early, like my mid twenties and early thirties, I had to kind of wrestle with not being competitive in a negative way and being competitive in like uh, competing with myself to like aspire to be the best I can, at, um, as opposed to like competing with all the artists I knew, you know. Um, but but it is. It, it, that's a really really good lesson because I think were I to have learned that earlier. It would have saved me a lot. <laughs> right, right. I love that. Um, do you guys ever work on like big projects, or do you ever work larger, or do you always work kind of small? Josh um, works huge. I work huge. <laughs> How big is huge? I know. Um, I know one, of you, uh, one of you does murals sometimes. That'd be big. Oh, not that big. Like I, I, I tend to work at nineteen by twenty-four for my comic pages. So. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. But not That's like, not I. I comic I, I, Yeah, I mean, when I did life painting in art school, we did like giant canvases and stuff. But, uh, but that was you know life painting, oil and stuff. Um, but yeah, in general, nineteen by twenty-four is my my go-to. It's not giant. Do you ever have pictures for yourself that you spend like weeks on or even months and sometimes you put them away and don't get back to them later or not? Maybe not. Ones that, ones I, ones I just sit on. Well, yeah. I just wondered, you always finish things pretty efficiently within a few days or a week, or do you ever have sometimes you sit around, you probably have sometimes things get in the way. So you, well, anyway, I guess what I'm getting though, all this is I yeah. have a picture I've started but I still never finished it. It's uh, I had this cool idea, I thought, of this giant Medusa. And uh, got a giant Medusa, and there's a boat up here, and the snakes are all attacking the boat. I and love it. I started the final big picture, and uh, I've never quite finished it. But I guess since I've told you all that, I'm going to get it out and show it to you. That's that's awesome, though. That kind of makes sense. Do you have any linger? Project Scott, that you're kind of. I've, I've got a few, like when I was doing T-shirt designs, I've got a whole list of, of like kind of parody T-shirts, and I started moving away from that. But I've got some that are like almost done, and sometimes I think I might as well just finish them and upload them. You know, but yeah. I just haven't got around to it. Yeah, I have like maybe a couple dead projects, but I but I don't tend to have long ones. But that's a cool idea to kind of have something. That's rad. <laughs> Well, anyway, this thing's kind of big. It's like, I don't know, 30, 20, 25 inches by 40 inches. So it's kind of a big picture. So but it's, good. it's not done yet, but it's close to done. We're just kind of showing to you a little bit. <laughs> That's awesome. So you've kind of carved away at that. So do you it's have... Very, it's very mixed media. Yeah. Um, it's done with an unusual style. I actually... I took white Elmer's glue and added India ink into it. Oh. And I, I, I covered this with abstract, uh, uh, what is it, glue all over the whole thing. And it sat around for several years. I didn't know what to do with it. And then I had the idea of putting this picture on top of it. It's mostly watercolor, some acrylic paint, but mostly watercolor. That's rad. That's very <laughs> But anyway, I've still got to finish this up. It's not done yet. That's a cool idea, though. I've always, uh, I've always kind of thought. I think the last project that I kind of was was sort of side working on was the um, was those haunted mansion portraits I did a couple of years back. Um, but that was just like a weird, almost like inside joke with my wife, where we 
we never thought we'd actually have a house because we're both illustrators. So we're like, we're never going to own a house. And so we were like, if we ever own a house, we're going to have haunted mansion style portraits. And we're going to have a dinosaur uh, head above our fireplace. And we stuck to both promises. But I had to make the little haunted mansion <laughs> portraits. But so those were something I did work on like, in between and, and they sat. Um, but I think with like the... With the graphic novels, they're all kind of, uh, and I think for Scott too, with the comics, those are all kind of those projects where our pages are carving away, but they're they're long projects that'll take years, you know. I don't know, um, but I do like the idea of having a painting to kind of add to, and um, I, I do miss painting quite often, um, and so that's something I almost think maybe I should indulge in at some point because it's yeah, yeah. a beautiful process. Yeah, yeah. I, my little painting class, I, I let them on some of the assignments do them on the computer if they want to, but I make them do at least half the assignments with traditional media just because I want them to have that experience. Some of them yeah. might never use traditional media again the rest of their life. <laughs> you know, so a lot of people are all just on the computer these days. And yeah. I, think it's, it's, uh, I think it's fun to experience traditional media that you can choose to use it if you want to. Yeah, and it's important too for for if you do actually end up doing digital because a lot of um, uh, a lot of students I've seen when they're trying to tackle digital painting kind of make the error of tackling it like digital painting instead of trying to think like what medium am I using like what am I mixing in here is it you know opaque is it like thinking about the the nature of the medium for so the approach is more similar to traditional and then you end up with a stronger digital um and, and a lot of students won't do that so then they'll end up with these these digital paintings that just look super blurry um with no kind of focus or no like flat areas of paint and uh so like i think i think learning traditionally is the ultimate way to kind of be able to do it visually effectively. i don't know scott do you think like like i mean i definitely think because scott you've started um, inking uh, more, more digitally. Yeah. And do you think that you have an advantage inking digitally in the fact that you know how to ink traditionally? Yeah, yeah. And the other thing, like with inking in particular, I still think, I think, I mean, if you're if you're kind of traditional inking, I still think it might even be a little faster because yep. when, you, when you ink digitally, a lot of times you make a stroke. And then you're not happy with that stroke, and it just it because there's a little still a little bit of a disconnect because it's just not quite like actual paper where when you have that feeling traditional media in that brush or that quill across that page, you just kind of it seems like you get it right. Now if you mess up, it's a little easier digital. But but what I find that I see myself and anyone else who's doing digital inks is they'll do a stroke and it just doesn't. It's it's not going the way they want, so they have to do that stroke two or three times. So stroke command Z, stroke command Z, stroke command Z, and then my problem, like part of why I still do most of my inking like traditionally is like um, I have the eternal zoom problem when I work digitally, mm -hmm. um, and and not so much on like graphic design or like you know like spot illustrations or something like that, but for my own personal work, like I'll just start zooming in. And then like adding all these little details and it's like i would never do that if i were working on on it in front of me uh, but for some reason just having that option open it i guess i could just limit it and just not zoom <laughs> but i for me like i still uh prefer if i can especially on personal work i, I want to work traditionally because it just doesn't feel right to me doing art and my hands aren't dirty after like i feel like my hands need to be covered in ink um, I need to have a couple of smudges here and there you know, that I have to wipe off. Like that feels like art. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. When, you, when you work on the computer, you've always got that glass in the way. You can't really yeah. touch it. You know, yeah. you can mess it up. I, I mean, even, yeah, it's uh, there's something different about it. And, uh, and you can splatter with a paintbrush and really use splatters and, and take your fingers and mess it up. Yeah. There whatever you want to do. And it's, it's just kind of nice to be able to touch the eye. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's hard to do the toothbrush technique <laughs> on a digital, you know? Yeah. Um, 
and and then if if you can do it, it's too controlled, you know. So it's like you don't have those like accidents where it smears and it's kind of cool. <laughs> like I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I know when I draw with a charcoal stick, it's just something kind of cool about drawing right on the paper, and I'm really controlling, you know, it all, and I don't have that extra step in there with the computer and the tools and stuff that it has to do it. Anyway, yeah. both both media, the, the computer is amazing. It has a lot of great uses and everything. Oh, yeah. But uh, for me, it'll never totally replace traditional media. Yeah, 100%. Um, uh, guys who do a lot more kind of rendered um, uh, digital paintings that I know, um, they, a lot of them attest that it's not that much faster to do digitally. What becomes faster is the revision. <laughs> and, and I can definitely, um, I can definitely see that because it's a lot, easier, it's, it's a lot quicker to kind of edit something in a vector, like an illustrator or in Photoshop than, than it is to have to scan what you're doing, clean it up in Photoshop, you know, cut out the parts and, and kind of fix it. But I still, if I can, I, I still stick traditional because I just love it. Um, I think we're all pretty hybrid though, like because um, like your your book, the, the one you showed, uh, crossing the control bridge. You know, some of that's digital, some of it's traditional. Um, right. I think that's the way to um, to go. That's awesome. Well, um, Scott, did you have any questions about? I mean, Scott, you just finished, uh, you know, your course on comics, like that crazy twenty-two week. <laughs> course um did you have any questions for frank i mean frank's been been teaching illustration for over 20 years now um, any questions you wanted to know like about regarding the teaching or well i just you know again like I, I mentioned before i mean some of the things frank was talking about i was i was uh trying to uh, you know put across in my course but uh, some of the ways that he presented, I think, were, were I wish I would have known at the time, like just the, the when you were talking about the shapes and how you did a little cutaway. I think visually that was really cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's tons of things, but I just I had always, you know, obviously I've always admired people that could teach. And it wasn't even until recently until after I did this course that I felt confident uh, like calling myself a teacher that I could I could present this stuff. So, um yeah, it just it's kind of a, a good feeling. So I just, I mean, like I just wanted to, you know, basically thank Frank and all all the you know teachers and things that helped me out. And it's it's nice to kind of get to a point where I can kind of do the same and kind of get back. So, but mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I I just I can kind of just see through the the few examples that I have seen, um, you know, just some some of the the really interesting way and, and and teachers all teach in different ways. So it's really it's really cool to see things that you've never it presented in ways that you've never seen taught before. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I just wanted to say, you guys, you really are in a way being people doing this art, art casters thing. A lot of people watch it and they're, they're picking up knowledge in, the, in a casual, fun sort of way. So I think that's cool. Yeah, yeah, we're aiming for it. It's, uh, I was telling Scott too that, that um, with, the, with the comics course too, I was, I was t <laughs> kind of letting him in on the, the dark secret of teachers that no teacher knows how to teach when they start teaching. Right. <laughs> and then you teach and then you get asked questions and you have answers for a lot of them. And you're like, Oh, I, I should be. <laughs> Cause I felt that way. Um, you know, from the few college courses I did adjunct, I, I like was like, I can do art stuff, but I don't know about this teaching. And then you have students, you know, uh, come in a class and and ask some pretty basic questions that you don't think are basic, like when you're a student, but you've gotten experience and knowledge, and you're like, oh, okay, um, yeah. So I, I, to me, it's like I think I, I, that's my suspicion. I don't think any teacher really knows how to teach until they teach. <laughs> I would say that's true. Cool. Yeah, I know. For me, um, I was taking some like workshops in New Mexico painting workshop with a four-day workshop or something and i was uh i was helping somebody a couple people near me you know with, they were having trouble doing something and i was yeah. to do it. And I just kind of noticed and i kind of liked helping people <laughs> and so that was the first time i ever thought about teaching uh, and actually um 
when I lived in Tucson, I took a class called advertising drawing. We used all markers and learned how to, you know, do cube spheres, cone cylinders, products, things like that with markers. And uh, and I thought I did pretty good in it. And this is actually kind of amazing. But the teacher at the end of the class asked me if I'd be interested in teaching the class next semester. And I mean, that was pretty radical. He actually invited me to teach the class. I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll try it. And that's why I picked up the class. That was the case with one of one of my instructors too. Was he was you know he was teaching and they and they, they said oh man you're you're good at this you should teach and then, so so and actually I was taught by both of them so it was kind of like the master and the student and then passing it on to a whole I guess generation or whatever but the, yeah I mean yeah awesome so that doesn't always happen but um, that was how I first started teaching at a community college in that's awesome yeah it was it was pretty amazing. That's amazing. And then I was actually there for a year, and I did that. And then I decided to go back to art school. I had never finished art center, so I went back, moved back to California, went back to art center after being gone several years. <laughs> but it was it was fine. Yeah, I I had a, a similar break when I, I I was trying to do the straight through, finishing like my my uh, BFA, and then I was like, I'm just gonna go straight for the MFA. And I'm like, I, I got about a year in and was like, I just want to do art. And I dropped out for like a while and kind of moved to a different state and figured stuff out. And then I came back and it took me, you know, quite a few years just to go back and finish that up because it was like, um, I th I, and I think that's important for, for people's journeys too, is like, you, you can't always just slam through college, <laughs> you know. Right. Plus, yeah, yeah. We we all have different journeys getting to where we're headed. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I love it. Well, well, Frank, uh, it's been an honor having you on. Uh, you were like one of the primary reasons I chose illustration. I think prior to that, I didn't really. There, there wasn't like I try to explain this to younger <laughs> younger uh, people. But it's like now there's like a center for cartoon studies and there's much more knowledge about like SVA and like these other schools that specialize in cartooning. But um, at the time I was getting into art colleges and stuff, there were pretty limited options in, uh, in the sense of like cartooning. And the one kind of route there was through illustration. And, uh, and, and, so, I, which I didn't even know of that route until having that class with Frank, and that was just such a, a mind-opening experience and um, uh, such a great teacher to have, I think, especially as a, as a young artist, uh, to get me inspired and excited about uh, about it. So I really appreciate that, too. Um, and we'd love to have you back on to get, like, more in the nitty-gritty with one of the multiple series we can we, we I'd be glad to come back sometime. Thank you. It's been fun. Awesome. Um, so, uh, so with that, uh, um, Frank, is there anything you want uh, people to to check out um, right now of, of your stuff? Uh, I mean, your website's right here. But I any think this is the first book I ever illustrated for a real publisher. It's called yes. Gas. Oh, cool. Nineteen ninety-seven. They uh, they printed one hundred and fifty thousand copies of the book. But it went out of print after four years. But you can still buy it on the internet, used. And uh, sometimes you can buy it for one penny. It's a pretty good price sometimes. Wow. But you should get two ninety nine shipping. But uh, anyway, I did all these illustrations in it, how to draw different fantasy creatures. Um, there's like a three-headed snake and different things. That's but, all. Uh, a long time ago, 1997. So I just thought I'd mention that. But you can still buy it, like I said, on the internet, on Amazon. That's awesome to draw fantasy creatures. I love it. And crossing the the troll bridge too. I, I would highly recommend it and uh, and check out Frank's work um, on his website. Thank you again for joining us. Um, so you're on my channel. You guys know where to find me. Uh, you know where to find my work. Um, if, if not, uh, just go to jockwithemble.com. And Scott. Uh, this show is confusing. It bounces from my channel to your channel. It's always back and forth. Um, so after you let us know where to find your work and possibly comic-related products, maybe let people know how they can keep track of this channel. 
Yeah, you can find uh, you can find my work at CircWorks.com. Like I said, all my digital products right now are forty percent off. Uh, the newest product right now is the Hero Design Studio, which has all kinds of tools that you can use to create your own superheroes, to design your own superhero costumes, and uh, it's it's good in most you know most of the popular graphic design or, or graphics programs, Photoshop, Illustrator, Procreate, Affinity Designer, Clip Studio Paint, all that. So anyway, check that out. Uh, and uh, yeah, and also my course on YouTube, Make Comics 101, uh, if you want to learn how to make comics step by step. And as Josh alluded to, that we do this show every week. Usually we do it on Thursdays, but you know who knows what happens. Sometimes we might do it at a different day. Sometimes we might do it at a different time. And also it switches back and forth from Josh's channel to mine. So I know that can be a little confusing. Like you might not know exactly whose channel to go to from week to week or whatever. Uh, the easiest way to figure all that out is to just join our mailing list. We don't spam you or anything like that. Uh, usually about 30 minutes ahead of time, I will send out, if you're on the newsletter, I'll send out a, a, a newsletter and it'll have the link you can click on and you'll know exactly where we're going to go live. And we'll also, you'll also know who the guests are going to be and everything like that. So yeah, check that out. Link in the description. Thanks again, Frank. And uh, thanks to everybody who joined us in the chat. It was a lively one. So uh, we appreciate all of you and we will see you guys next week. Thank you. Later, everyone.